Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 886. I am Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and today is October 15th, 2024. All right, welcome to another episode of the wonderful program we call Anglican Unscripted. We've been running for more than a decade. We have 886 episodes under our belt. Not yet. This this is 886. We actually have 885 done so far. And we're glad you could join us. Before we get too far into the program, it would be really wonderful for us if you click that thumbs up. It looks just like my thumb. You find that on Facebook and YouTube, and it promotes kind of a, a false narrative to, to YouTube and Facebook. It tells them that this is an awesome program and that they should internally promote it for us. It's free advertising. If you've not done so recently, go to the comment sections. When this show is done, the comment section just becomes alive for two or three days. People tell us their thoughts, they tell us their opinions, they give us other resources, and it's a wonderful place where you can do the same. We appreciate your comments, your ideas, and story ideas for stuff we've not covered yet. If you've not done so, please subscribe. There's a little rectangle that says subscribe. If it's red, you have not subscribed yet. You click that little red uh, rectangle, up comes the bell, and lo and behold, you can get instant notifications after you click that bell. Um, anything I've not mentioned, you have shared this. I know you all shared this, so we, we got that covered. George, survivor of two hurricanes on the western shores of Florida. How are you doing this week? I'm doing great. Uh, I would do want to tag on to that, something that you said, the importance of uh, comments and uh, corrections. Mm -hmm. uh, just some some major stuff some because this is unscripted we don't you know read from a script we do it from our memories and so we'll mangle things so for oh, a long gosh. time i called douglas murray charles murray oops because charles <laughs> murray was somebody a who i yeah. read 25 years ago and yeah. douglas murphy's and and of course they're very different people and then the little things like i've never been to the town of f-o-w-e-y so it looks like fuck Fowey to me, oh, and people say it's Foy. What now? That you know, be. unless unless you're uh, a local or you know you're English, and so. But you know, it's important not to uh, compound you know mistakes by repeating. So if I said Fowey for the next fifty episodes, it'll cause some people to blow up. But you need to tell me it's Foy. Yeah. So things of that nature, as, as well as uh, uh, frankly, if you disagree with uh, where we're coming from not as a troll but as as somebody who just doesn't uh appreciate the depth of our knowledge or wisdom. we have one or two trolls and i appreciate them it, it means a lot to me that they, they still hang out a lot of trolls just come and go and uh, our two or three trolls hang out and they watch the show and you can tell they watch the entire episode by how they're trying to troll and i, I i'm sorry i appreciate that and I'm glad we don't have 50 trolls or 100 trolls, but um, I, I have a much wider variance for people who are allowed to comment on Anglican and Scripted than we do have on Anglican Inc. Anglican Inc. is a lot more tighter, um, has a, a, a different type of audience uh, in, in a broader context. Uh, so the moderator of Anglican Inc. has strict uh, uh, adherence to my list of rules there. He does a, a wonderful job. So um, yeah. Uh, you know, we appreciate you guys hanging out. We appreciate you guys uh, commenting. And I think that's really kind of the the genesis for our next episode is reading the comments uh, and comparing to the news that's going on out there. There was somebody who uh, went to town on my uh, uh, comments about uh, Richard Hooker. I don't find Richard Hooker's three-legged stool to be all even legs. You know, I, I didn't have time to, to comment on all that, but you know, these are things that we talk about off the top of our heads. It's unscripted. If you guys would not watch a scripted show, uh, well, this is not Kamala Harris. This is somebody else. This is you know completely unscripted. Kevin, I think the most uh, anger I've ever seen in our comments mm -hmm. was when you identified the gate guard at your compound as carrying an AK-47. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I don't know how I it must have been uh, our show must have been broadcasted at NRA convention or something because <laughs> that's what, what are you talking agrees. about why would a US <laughs> Army soldier carry an AK-47 yeah 
Because we have an international audience, and it, it, when we started out, 90% of our audience was American. Uh, you know, it, here we had the, the tech war going on. Not uh, only American, they yeah. were Americans. Americans, Americans. And I think the, the average age was 65. It was just people who, uh, mostly uh, priests and clergy who were going through the, the church wars at the time. Now, only 40% of my audience here is American. Uh, the rest is international. It, it, it's stunning to watch that number as uh, we're 40% uh, American, we're probably 42% uh, Europe, in the rest around the world, uh, whether it be Hong Kong or China or Taiwan or South, uh, Africa. South Africa, Slavic countries, ex-Soviet blocs. It, it, you know, the, the personal email I get because people can't comment because they're, they're, they're from a, a communist country and would be uh, you know, arrested or murdered for watching the show, it's, it's astonishing. I, it, it's the most humbling thing. You can wake up in the morning and say, Lord, you had me in over my head again. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to do this. Uh, and it, it takes you to a different place in prayer because uh, uh, please understand, Kevin has no training for being a host of an Anglican theological news program. None, not, 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 not an ounce. You, go, you must have some seminary, Kevin. No, 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 no. <laughs> so, it, the, other thing, the other thing I think we might want to mention is that how the center of the Anglican world has shifted over the years, news mm -hmm. world. And that um, when we started the... Uh, I might turn off the ringer. When we started, <laughs> nine out of ten stories were America because America was on fire. Mm -hmm. Now, nine out of ten stories are English or European based. The the, the okay. center yeah. of the fight is the UK and Rome. What's happening in Rome, we'll talk about more often than what's happening in New York, mm -hmm. simply because I think the we've entered the stalemate. And uh, in the United States, there's no big moves here and there, whereas there's a lot going on in the UK and in uh, in the Catholic world that impacts the Anglican world. Yeah, I, I spent this weekend with my wife. We drove up to uh, Connecticut to visit some old friends. And the number one topic was what's happened to the Generation X or Z, whatever, the latest generation, and just the the... Two of them were school teachers, and just the absolute desolation of public schools. Uh, they had they they're told to promote kids even if they can't read or can't do math. Just get get move them up up the system, and you know, it, it astonishing conversation. The second most popular topic we talked about for four hours was Pope Francis. Now these are Anglicans, ex Episcopalians. They, they, you know, as far as they're concerned, the ACNA is winning. It's no longer a worry. There's no longer a church war. Um, but what's happening with Pope Francis and Rome is topic du jour because uh, they're going. You know, if if Rome gives way, what's left? You know, and so yeah, that's topic door. We should move on to some stories here. We're we're twelve minutes in. Story number one: Scotland's new abortion services act. Uh, we have reported, and I did an interview with Elizabeth Elizabeth von Spruce uh, a couple months ago who was ticketed for having silent prayer in front of an abortion clinic in Birmingham? Was that, you know, somewhere in the UK? And uh, um, she fought that, and she was eventually vindicated in court for silent prayer. Uh, the UK had come up with a uh, law that says you can't pray within a couple hundred feet meters if you're from England of an abortion clinic she was walking silently through this area and was questioned by police who cited her and that has come and gone vindicated now Scotland has a new more succinct specific law uh, to get rid of that vagueness and let's talk a little bit about that George yeah and we mentioned uh, we were tipped to this uh, by Elizabeth Vaughn yes mm -hmm. and that uh, because normally Scottish civil affairs wouldn't come under our radar. But Scotland's new Abortion Services Act imposes a 200 meter safe access zone around clinics, and it criminalizes silent prayer or religious expression, even if the silent prayer or religious expression 
takes place in a private house if that house is visible or audible within the zones. So if you had a prayer meeting in your front room and across the street was an abortion clinic and people could look through your window and see you on your knees praying, you are subject to a 10,000 pound fine. Now, unlike the British laws, uh, the Scottish new law identifies, quote, religious preaching and silent vigils as activities that can be restricted to performed with intent or recklessness. So Elizabeth Vaughn Spruce, if she went up to Scotland, she would be arrested for praying with intent or reckless prayer. But if she sneezed and I said gesundheit, that's that's probably okay. Yeah, that's involuntary. That, prayer, that's involuntary. Okay, all right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the uh, Church of Scotland, of course, is withering on the vine, and the Scottish Episcopal Church is not too far behind them, and they really have not been speaking out. It's been people, civil liberties groups, uh, right to life groups, activists like Elizabeth Vaughn Spruce. So the church, I hate to say, I mean, the Catholic Church has spoken out, but the Protestant world is just absent without leave in this fight, or so as I understand it. And again, I don't know everything that's happening in Scotland, but the but Anglicans you, are not pulling their pulling their weight in this fight. Well, nobody is. No, no Christian is, and that's the shame in this. If that law were here to occur in Maryland, I would be cited. I would go there and do that uh, to bring attention to uh, the ra lack of free speech, the what the law really is trying to do, and you know, there's there's nothing wrong as a Christian in being uh, confrontational in that way to show that you know you're coming against my religious freedom. Now, I would assume we probably have more religious freedom here in America. We certainly have a better freedom of speech laws, and well, the fact that yeah, Elizabeth. Elizabeth was vindicated gives me hope, but I don't know about Scotland. And we we we're so blessed in the United States, but we just had John Kerry, who ran for the United States presidency, uh, was a, who is saying that the First Amendment is a problem. It's a yeah, that yeah, it's a problem. We need to regulate speech because of misinformation as defined by the government. Hillary Clinton and said the same Hillary thing. Clinton she said the same thing. Yeah. Um, if the the if now that's just two people clinton and uh carrie if but if their worldview is successful that would criminalize uh so much of what we would do uh in talking about moral issues mm -hmm. now they tried to do this in california where gavin newsom signed into law a, a bill that uh that uh, criminalized making fun Oh, parody uh, memes yes. parodies yeah. and memes of uh and of course the, the federal court struck it down um so it's not going anywhere but there is a push and it's not just in england but in the united states and around the world in europe in germany and france to censure to censor thought and speech that does not conform to what the those in power want to hear mm -hmm. He, and it's interesting because what was parody and humor five or six years ago has now become news. You know, uh, the things we used to make fun of, uh, you can't make fun of anymore because now it's now news. It's in the news. What used to be uh, something we uh, would call conspiracy uh, in 2020 uh, or 2021 20, with COVID, we now find out more truth has come out and that we weren't quite as wrong as we thought we were. In fact, we were right about some of the things we were we were questioning. And that doesn't come out in a, uh, a communist country. You don't find out until communism falls all the things that were we're bad about the country. Let's move on. The university... Is, and, the, yeah, go ahead. The, 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 I, I would say that what some people don't understand is that for a pro-life activist, they see abortion as murder. Mm -hmm. And they cannot in good conscience shut up. They cannot in good conscience not pray because there is evil in front of them being done under the name of the laws of their government. It's the same degree of motivation that our forefathers in the United States when we had the abolitionists talking about, about slavery, is uh, it's not the black man, my brother, mm -hmm. um, and created equally by God to me. And I cannot be quiet. So this is not something where like, 
well, we disagree on uh, Proposition One Two Three about uh, taxation. Yeah, in, Flor yeah. in Florida, we've got a pro we've got a ballot initiative to permit uh, sale of marijuana, like Colorado. Now, yeah, you know, there are issues on both sides. I'm going to vote no because I'm a killjoy. I don't want anybody to have fun, and but that's a different degree of uh, argument than over than the abortion argument is. yeah it is it, you know but you know in the, in the same manner um this is like slave owners trying to protect uh owning slaves when you when you're coming up against uh these type of laws and you're just not you're not allowed to talk about it a slave owner would not let, allow an abolitionist near them or near the slaves or near uh, their town and that's the same thing happening here with abortion you're not allowed to talk about it you're not allowed to pray about it you're certainly not allowed to have a voice in this conversation the only voice is pro-abortion and well, what if what if britain had these laws 200 years ago when william wilberforce and the abolitionists fought for a generation to get rid of slavery huh? and the joke is the all this stuff about the, some commonwealth nations want to charge britain 200 billion pounds for the slave trade when it was Britain who ended the slave trade. Britain was the one who, you know. The first to stand it. up, yeah. yeah. And it was and it was driven by Christian abolitionists. Mm -hmm. And if we had these laws in practice back then, how much longer would a slavery last? Well, we don't know because you'll probably have to have a trigger warning in front of any book that talks about Wilbur. Uh, and so let's talk about the next Topic du jour, the University of Nottingham has added a trigger warning to the Canterbury Tales. Now, I read it a long time ago. Uh, let's talk about the Canterbury Trails. Most uh, uh, Anglicans should at some point in their lives preview it at least. Well, it, most, uh, well, at least in our generation, you had to read it in high school, or at least yeah. extracts from it. Extracts, yeah. Uh, Canterbury Tales is a 14th century literary work by Geoffrey Chaucer. And it consists of 24 individual stories, and it's structured around a storytelling contest among a group of pilgrims traveling to the tri shrine of St. Thomas of Becket in Canterbury, hence Canterbury Tales. The tales, yes. And each tale reflects the diverse backgrounds and personalities of the pilgrims while offering sort of insight into the medieval life, morality, and religious belief. And the University of Nottingham has put a trigger warning on the Canterbury Tales saying it's expressions of Christian faith might be harmful to students. Hmm. Okay. You know, 18, 19, 20 year olds in college in England, you know, once upon a time, these people were asked to storm the shores of Normandy or go over the top of the trenches uh, in France and Flanders. But now they're so fragile that they cannot read the Canterbury Tales. They're not so fragile that in sixth and seventh and eight year olds here in America cannot be shown books about how little boys can masturbate together uh, or have anal sex together. You know, that's uh, that's first, second, and third grade content now in some public school systems here in America. Uh, but yeah, let's be careful of the Christians because uh, they have tried to colonize the earth and led disease and wiped out the Indians. You know, so. Oh, mm. again, this is one of these things that we got a link from uh, some of our viewers, Andrea Minichilla Williams of Christian Concern. She had a, a statement about this, and she said, without an understanding of the Christian faith, there's no way for students to accept the world of Chaucer and his contemporaries. It's ludicrous to issue such a trigger warning. It, it's a question of academic freedom. You can't understand the Canterbury Tales if you don't understand the Christian worldview that is driving the people to go on a religious pilgrimage. It's, you know, her word is, the word she uses, ludicrous, is absolutely true. Sure. And the thing it, is, yeah. you know, we may be picking on the University of Nottingham, but, you know, I can remember when my children were in high school, it's gone back 10 years, we started having these things, you can't read Mark Twain. Huckleberry Finn. Character yeah. of Huck, one of the characters in Huckleberry Finn has now an offensive name. Mm -hmm. I had to. Rem I remember having to read a book by Joseph Conrad uh, co called "The Blank of the Narcissus" when I was in high school. Oh, that book yep. has dis disappeared. 
Now, the, uh, or even Agatha Christie, uh, one of her books, uh, 10 Little Indians, actually had a different little name when it was written. Uh, the point is, this whole trigger warning concept is creating a generation of people who are mentally ill. I don't have any other way to say that. Because if you go through life and that word sets you off, you're going to be a failure in life. You're not going to survive or thrive in a difficult environment. Well, but so many of the, this latest generation have isolated themselves completely. Uh, there was a poll asking how many of your friends disagree with you politically or other things, uh, have a, a, a opposing view of you on some politics. And yeah, amongst Gen Z and the millennials, it, it, the, it was zero, zero percent. I, I would never surround myself with those type of people. And I've cut my parents off who are the, who have opposing views. And that's just, that's, you know, that's a cult. If you can't uh, um, hang around other people because your ideas may be challenged and you may change your ideas because of that challenge, you're in a cult. Um, so, well, I mean, why do we get so worked up about Scientology? Yeah, <laughs> because this is what Scientology <laughs> does yeah. in alienating and breaking things up. And yet we've instituted a public school system that takes the worst sort of aspects of that cultishness and <laughs> makes it mainstreams it. I remember when I was a little boy, and you can't see the, this anywhere, anywhere. You probably can't even find it on the internet. I saw the Disney movie Song of the South. Okay. Zippity doo da. Zippity doo da. Zippity day. And uh, you can't see that anymore. That has disappeared from any catalog of anywhere. Um, and I saw it at some film club in, in early middle school. So, yeah, 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 it's gone. Let's move on to the other news here. And uh, shame on Nottingham for, well, no, if you want to put a trigger warning on there, fine. You know, that that's your right to do. Church of we England. Just put a trigger warning on the University of Nottingham. Idiocy yeah. taught here. <laughs> Jeez. Tr I mean, if you go to the library, how many books are written by Christians in their life? I mean, whatever church of england v evangelical council not letting idea of a parallel province go so let's talk a little bit about that idea um church of england for all intents and purposes has um destroyed itself from in they're just you know a, a little way from uh electing and, and voting in llf uh it is already being practiced and the world knows it, but they don't care. But there's still some churches within the Church of England who want to do something. And having a parallel province is one of those suggestions, George. Yeah, the bishops of the Church of England have said, no, 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 no. We're not going to have a third province in the Church of England mm -hmm. for traditionalists, conservatives, evangelicals, Anglo-Catholics, whatever. And so the Church of England Evangelical Council is not given up. They said, okay, if we can't have a de, de jure, meaning under law, a third province, we'll have a de facto one. So we'll have a federation of 500 to 1,000 Orthodox churches, and we will all send our money to the, the de facto provincial office, and that will pay for our own seminarians, our own pastoral assistants. And we'll basically be stepping not out of the Church of England, but to one side of the Church of England, so that we will not follow into heresy those who seek to contravene the clear words of God on sexual and human morality. Now, the uh, question are, are there really 500 to 1,000 churches? And why do they need to do this? Well, you know, LLF is being driven through the Church of England. Martin Snow, uh, probably in exchange for being the next Archbishop of Canterbury, has been tasked with making this palatable and getting it through. And if he succeeds, he's the odds-on choice. Yeah. If he fails, well, you took a bullet for the team, Martin, but uh, we'll pick somebody else. Is there, are there 500 to 1,000? I think so. 
Now, there may be only about 200 right now who can stand alone financially and politically. But let's say you are a uh, you have a parish benefits of six or seven rural congr rural churches uh, in the countryside. Most of your con most of your congregation are very conservative, but there are few of them, and they could probably only pay half of what it costs to keep uh, operations running. And so you rely on a diocese st stipend or church commissioners largesse. If there are if there is money to be found from an Orthodox province, and you're still in the Church of England, then those people are very likely to come over, and so you would see up to a thousand active congregations who can if they can overcome the financial burdens and the cultural burdens of of uh, change then i think it's a doable project well we'll just have to see that's yeah and martin davy who's the former theologian to the house of bishops has done the few number of papers saying look all of the arguments put forward by the bishops well you can't do this um, basically have no historical, legal, or theological justification. It's just, we've always done it this way, and we don't want to give up any of our authority. Well, that's, that's not a good enough reason. Well, you say this is be the third. Uh, remind us again why we have the York. Well, because in the medieval time, at one time there were three province, three archbishoprics. Yeah. I think Litchfield was one in the seven or eight hundreds. And mm -hmm. it just was, you know, the different kingdoms, uh, different parts of the country. And one was the north, one was the south. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. And then there were also, I think, pre uh, three provinces in Ireland, uh, Armagh, uh, Dublin, and uh, I think, it, was it Tuam? Or, there was a third. So in other words, there were five provinces in the Church of England at one time when the Church of England included Ireland. Mm -hmm. Times are changing. All right, let's move back to the Scottish Episcopal Church. We talked about them in our first story. Um, and they have, as the bishops uh, decided, not to prosecute Anne Dyer, who we refer to as the bullying bishop. Church attorney says there is sufficient evidence to convict her of bullying, but the cost of the trial and the divisions it would bring would cause more damage. Once again, we're not holding a bishop, a bad bishop, accountable. Well, Ann Dyer has a reputation of being the wicked witch of the North. Uh, Aberdeen and Orkney is the farthest northern diocese, and it's the most conservative Scottish Episcopal diocese. It's a small diocese uh, in terms of number of people and clergy. It's mostly rural, it's outside of Aberdeen and whatnot. And Dyer, when the diocese had an election, they were unable to agree on a candidate. So the bishops of the Scottish Episcopal Church appointed Anne Dyer a Church of England priest who had been the dean of a seminary in England. And so the first woman bishop was, you know, Anne Dyer in Scotland. And she was very, she is very liberal, pro-gay and all this and that. A total mismatch to the diocese. Now, what was not revealed at the time was that she was looking for a job because she had just been let go by the seminary where she was teaching because of bullying act accusations she was a real tyrant mm -hmm. well she goes up to aberdeen and or aberdeen and she carries on the same management style being a real sop and things fell apart pretty quickly and two independent reviews were conducted and both of them said look this woman cannot stay because she just is totally totally unqualified to exercise the office of bishop well each time the other bishop said fine thank you Let's do it again. And it reached the point where finally formal legal charges were presented against her. The church attorney, procurator general, whatever they're called in Scotland, investigated. And he reported that there is sufficient evidence to convict her of these crimes, but the costs for trials and the collateral damage within the church of Scot Scottish Episcopal Church would be greater than getting rid of Van Dyer.
they've spent several hundred thousand pounds so far in these commissions and legal investigations and they just don't have the money and dyer is fighting this tooth and nail i mean and what so can they, they what can they do yeah. punt, punt yeah punt basically tell her to be a good girl finish out her you know retire at 65 and then go and this of course is called the victims the clergy in aberdeen and orkney's to go bananas because they're getting the wicked witch back and is she going to take her revenge on the people who had her suspended yeah, yeah. so so the uh complainers in the diocese are now entering into the bomb shelters waiting for the hurricane to pass whatever analogy you want to use but it really is a shame that uh financial considerations drove this decision not truth not justice not pastoral care and it also speaks uh, now maybe a deal was made so that she can stay for a month then discover that oh i have a medical condition that nobody knew about so i have to step down maybe they're giving her a graceful out we don't know don't but know. where it stands today the only person happy is ann dyer because she claims she's not claiming she's been vindicated because she was not found guilty yet mm. innocent until proven guilty and it's not been proven because the, they threw out the case uh, they, they they may learn to regret that, but all right, it's, it's not too hard for. Uh, uh, let's move on to other news. Uh, public. Uh, it, it, yeah. Here's the thing: the thing is that she is claiming her opponents are driven by misogyny and homophobia. She's not a lesbian, but she supports mm. that, mm. and so she's wrapping herself in the mantle of victimhood. Yeah, and this is why it would divide the church because there are other Scottish Episcopalians who listen to the victim claims and think this is what's happening when it's not what is happening and so she's cleverly found uh a cloak in which to uh cover her actions she'll keep her paycheck she gets her job back and she gets to be who she was born to be a bullying bishop let's move on to some more news um this is kind of a, a niche story there was a public scolding of bishop-elect of wolverhampton tim wambunya a kenyan bishop who moved to england to serve as a parish priest now i saw some of this happening on facebook where i saw a huge apology oops i didn't know but <laughs> before we get to that what did he do that he didn't know that raised the ire of Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. Tim Wembunya uh, was a parish priest in England, formerly having been a bishop in Kenya and a professor in Kenya. Mm -hmm. He was asked by a former student who was leading a network of uh, independent churches in Germany if he would come and lay hands on him, sort of as the overseer or bishop of this semi-Pentecostal group. And Tim, as a favor to his former student and friend, went and did it. Then after the fact, several months here, several months later, he is offered the position of uh, Bishop of Wolverhampton, which I always sort of find funny because Enoch Powell, the, uh, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Bishop of Wolverhampton, <laughs> well, that's a different story. Yes, it is. Yeah, that he's offered the position. Now, Wambunya is an evangelical. He's conservative. He is orthodox. Do, so, yeah. Well, he's yeah. orthodox. Yeah and this caused the left to start digging and they found this and then they started a campaign on social media to shame him into resigning and to basically have justin welby you cannot allow this man to be a bishop because he has handed off the apostolic orders to somebody who's not an anglican and this yeah. and the other and tim wambunya basically did a what I call a Connie Francis letter. I'm sorry, so sorry. sorry. Please accept my apology. And it should now be over. But what we saw was a double standard from the establishment and the left in England. Um, if you're conservative and if you step over the line, even slightly, you're gonna get hammered. If you're a liberal, there's nothing's gonna happen to you. You can be the Bishop of Oxford and cover up or ignore child abuse you can be the archbishop of canterbury who can take yeah. six or seven years to oversee a process where you are one of the problems and there's no no grief but if you're george Carey or tim wambunya um you look you cough 
look the wrong direction. The ton of bricks falls on your head. Like praying in Scottish abortion clinics. Yeah. Uh, all right. Next story here. Uh, this is a fun story. Uh, just here in America, let's back up a couple years ago. The Supreme Court canceled the Eucharist of uh, feminism here by taking out abortion. They said abortion can only be decided state by state. There's no longer a federal uh, constitutional guarantee to access to abortion. Roe v. Wade was effectively overturned. And feminists of every variety have come out and uh, the vile and anger of having their Eucharist canceled, the, the sacrament of theirs, has just... Uh, it, it's amazing to watch and a larger part if, if there was no um, election shenanigans this is probably the reason Trump lost uh, there may have been shen shenanigans but uh, just the ire of the feminists here in America uh, probably turned out the 81 million but I, I don't know that I'm just I'm, I'm going off the top so every time I see something odd happening like uh, Governor of Michigan Gretchen Whitmer uh who, who is kind of the Catherine Jefferts Shorey of Michigan, uh, I, I go, hmm, they're, they're missing their, their Eucharist. George, uh, the Catholic Church and much of t uh, TikTok and social media has blown up because Governor Whitmer uh, has participated in a TikTok video where she gives a Dorito chip to a woman on her knees, mimicking a priest, uh, you can do that on camera, uh, by giving her, uh, someone a Holy Communion on her tongue. Ouch. Yeah, where Gretchen Whitmer is the priest and the mm -hmm. TikTok, uh, I think they're called influencer. Okay. Uh, very much into the abortion and liberal rights stuff, liberal yeah. activism stuff, is the penitent receiving communion. And it then pulls back up to Rit Whitmer's face, making a funny look. And the when this came out, the Catholic bishops of Michigan blew up because to them this was an obvious mockery of the Eucharist. Whitmer has been a fierce opponent of the Catholic Church. She's an active abortion rights activist and has mm -hmm. hammered the church again and again on various issues. And now she is engaged in this blatant, in the Catholic's worldview, mockery of the Eucharist. Well, um, Whitmer's first response was, oh, this has nothing to do with the Eucharist. This is about the CHIPS, C-H-I-P-S Act, computer chips, and it was designed to be edgy and hip and have Michigan be a leader in computer chip manufacturing in the future. Now, as lame excuses go, this has got to be the lamest no, excuse I've, I've, I've heard. heard. I, my, 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 my kids have given worse, but go on, go on. <laughs> well, then Whitmer pulls out one of her political allies, Bonnie, uh, oh, what's her name? Bishop, uh, uh, Bonnie Perry. Perry, that's right. The Episcopal yeah. Bishop of Michigan, mm -hmm. which is the southeast corner of Detroit and its environments. And Bonnie Perry came and says, no, 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 no. This was not a mockery, the Eucharist. You have to take it in context. You have to understand her motivations. We need to move on past this and not focus on side issues, but focus on what's important for people in Michigan. So the blasphemous Eucharist with a Dorito chip is excused by the Episcopal Bishop of Michigan uh, for political purposes to support one for political allies. And it, it, it's just almost like yeah, yeah. T tell me another one that's not going to shock me, that Bonnie Perry is uh, joining forces with abortion activist uh, governor and who is widely viewed by conservatives to have uh, cro crookedly thrown the 2020 election in Michigan. Yeah. Um, then the Episcopal Church bishop is right in there, shoulder to shoulder with her. Yeah, it's... It, okay, back up a second. In the whole scheme of things... Uh, as a Christian, I don't mind being mocked. Okay, persecution and, and prosecution grows the church. If you need to persecute me to, to express yourself or whatever, fine, I'm here for you. 
Um, you know, I, I've been mocked since I was in high school from my belief. Not, you know, my, my, my skin is a little thicker than that. Um, and I, so I, I, it doesn't really curl my skin to see this other than it's a confirmation that uh, the world hates us. You know, uh, the secular world led by uh, this uh, feminist activist governor and this feminist activist lesbian uh, bishop, they hate us. Okay, fine. You know, uh, I, I, it's, I'm not going to go to bed uh, without uh, sleeping well tonight. You know, it, it is what it is. All right, last story, George. Perth. Yes. Okay. Well, all the way, all the corner of the world. Yes, way <laughs> down south, as we say here in the lower 48. Perth Diocese poised to take the first step in normalizing gay clergy and sex blessings. Sex blessings. What has taken so long, you may be asking. Uh, the Senate has approved the changes, but Archbishop K. Goldsworthy is sitting on the changes. I am shocked. Okay, because uh, is when she was elected, and I remember uh, uh, conversations with uh, the olds and others that she's going to be the one who overturns this and, and takes us uh, on a highway to hell, as they say. And uh, now she's like getting cold feet, George. Yeah, David Old has uh, written extensively about this. The mm -hmm. Perth Synod has delivered. It has uh, uh, passed a resolution changing the definitions of uh, clergy morals mm -hmm. and things of that nature. Now, ev so far, uh, everything that, you know, there are gay clergy in Australia and so on and so forth, and there are some uh, sort of uh, hidden gay blessings in marriages and whatnot. And it's coming down to, because it's sort of silent on these points, we know we, we can get away with it. And now, the Perth Senate is basically changing sexually moral relations include same sex and things of that nature, being explicit, which would open up the doors and that, you know, clergy that have been prevented from being ordained or licensed could now be licensed, get marriages could take place, so on and so forth. Well, Kay Goldsworthy who was elected uh, specifically to implement liberal changes in Perth has gotten cold feet. And she's sitting on this resolution, which will not go into effect unless she approves it. And the left is furious with her because she doesn't want to go first. She wants the people in uh, uh, Brisbane to go first, I think. And well, she's take, take the heat. <laughs> and uh, I'm just I'm reading her mind. I shouldn't, but it, no you know, well, two places would be Brisbane or Perth, and Perth has done it, but Perth is hanging fire. I read this and I have a 2002-2003 flashback. The old Frank Griswold, who uh, uh, promised everybody, even though uh, uh, Gene Robinson was elected, I, I would not do that. I would not go and concentrate and lay hands on him. Of course not. Um, who do you, what do you think I am? And lo and behold, you know, months later, you see a picture of him uh, laying hands uh, uh, from a camera they had above, on uh, Gene Robinson consecrating him to be the Bishop of New Hampshire. And I was I there. You were there. <laughs> you were there. In the audience. <laughs> and so um, I think this is a case Frank Griswold moment. You know, you got to do it where, or not do it. Whereas Frank, Frank Griswold initially told the primates at the emergency meeting in London after the yeah. Episcopal General Convention affirmed his election that he would yeah. not consecrate Gene Robinson mm -hmm. and then changed his mind. Kay Goldsworthy has basically kept her mouth shut. And if Frank Griswold had kept his promise to the primates not to consecrate Gene Robinson, where would we be as a church today? There would be no ACNA. There would still be some persecution of the conservatives in the Episcopal Church by uh, liberals and uh, other activists. There will be, still be uh, much strife in a almost unified Episcopal Church. Yeah. Who knows? I mean, just think of the Colorado election of uh, it was it 1999 or when, when you know for bishop. I mean, there's you can go back in history 
of uh, you know every couple of years and say, what if this had been different? What if what if this had been different? What yeah. if we looked last year into the election in Albany? Yeah, uh, where where Albany went flipped from uh, uh, traditionalist to uh, a bishop. Yeah, out there, out there, <laughs> way out there. Yeah, the, the, those you know what if. Uh, God doesn't play what ifs. He knows the the beginning, the middle, and the end of the story, and uh, uh, we just want to be included in the story. And we do that through uh, an active and healthy relationship with the Father. All right, how many minutes we got here? Forty eight minutes. We're letting the class go early today. I'm Kevin Coulson, and I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode eight hundred and eighty six of Anglican Unscripted.